This video is the first lecture of the course Single Cell RNA Seq Data Analysis with Chipster, and here I aim to give a brief introduction to Single Cell RNA Seq Data Analysis. So, first we will have a look how Single Cell RNA Seq works and what can go wrong in the process. So, what are empties, doublets, and dropouts? You will also learn what is a UMI and why do we use them. Then we move on to discuss why this kind of data is challenging to analyze and what are the main analysis steps you need to take when clustering cells and finding market genes for those clusters. To finish with, we discuss what is the RA, and I also give a brief introduction to the course. So single cell rna seq is a relatively new technology and the data analysis methods are still being actively developed. With this kind of gene expression profiling at single cell level, you can do many things. So you can detect cell types, also rare ones, study cellular differentiation processes, investigate tumor heterogeneity and response to drugs, etc. There are many technologies for capturing single cell transcriptomes. In this course, we focus on 10x chromium data, and this is a droplet based method. It's good to remember that usually these libraries are three prime tagged, meaning that we sequence only a short stretch of the three prime end of the transcript. So let's have a look at this droplet based method. Here we have uh, barcoded beads. So they have PCR handle, cell barcode, and unique molecular identifier or UMI, followed by a long stretch of T's. So the function of these T's is to catch the messenger RNAs by the poly A tail. The cell barcode helps us to know from which cell the read comes from, and the UMI helps to detect PCR duplicates. So we take these beads and cells and mix them and aim to have droplets where we have one bead and one cell. Sometimes it happens that there is no cell in the droplet or that there are two or even more cells in a droplet. But ideally there is one cell and that cell is healthy. So first we lyse the cell, the RNA binds to the, to the stretch of these and the beads. And after that we can disrupt the, the droplets and put all the cells together so there will be reverse transcription and PCR amplification and then we sequence and we sequence paired ends so that the read one covers the cell barcode and the UMI and the read two covers the cDNA part. Uh, then we align these to genome to know from which uh, genes transcript the read comes from so we get the gene information here. We can sort these pairs based on the cell barcode and then we look at the UMIs. So for example here we have a situation when where in this one cell we have two reads for this particular gene and the UMIs are identical meaning that these reads come from one particular mRNA molecule. So hence we don't want to count this twice but we only count it once and we will put one in the UMI count matrix. Then here we have a different situation where the uh, reads for this gene actually have different UMIs meaning that they come from two separate messenger RNA molecules and hence we will put two in the UMI matrix. So in this matrix we have cells as columns and genes as rows and each value corresponds to the UMI count. This figure as the previous one are from the microscope paper. So what can go wrong? As I already said, sometimes there is no cell in the droplet but there can still be some ambient RNA floating around so we will get some reads but those reads will match only to a small number of genes so we can detect empties based on that. A simple way to 
to detect a duplex and multiplex is also using the number of genes expressed. So typically, if there are more cells in the droplet, then this number if is larger than for the other cells. It can also be that the cell is not happy, so it can be broken or dead. And in that case, we typically get high percentage of the reads mapping to mitochondrial genes. So again, that can be used for detecting and removing the dead cells. In the case of dropsic, there can be problems in the synthesis of barcodes. For example, a base can be missing, and this kind of things can be also dealt with. So why is single cell RNA-seq data challenging? First of all, there is a high number of dropouts, and with dropout we mean a gene which is expressed, but we just fail to detect that expression. So as a consequence of this, we end up having lots of zeros in our UMI count table, and we say that the data is zero inflated. The data is also noisy because there is a lot of technical variation. The percentage of mRNAs captured varies. Also, the reverse transcription efficiency varies, and there can be amplification biases. So there can be bigger differences in the total number of UMIs per cell, and we say that the, the sequencing depth differs. There can be also biological reasons affecting the results, so both cell size and cell cycle stage. So the distributions of expression values we get are very complex, so we don't get nice normal distributions, but we typically get this multimodal distributions. Because the data is so special, the analysis methods that we have for bulk RNA-seq data won't work for single cell RNA seq. So, in this course, we start with the UMI count matrix and we aim to cluster cells and find market genes for them. So, here are the typical steps. First, we need to check the quality of the cells and filter out those empties and doublets, etc., and broken cells. We also filter genes. So, for example, if there is a gene which is expressed in only one cell out of the thousands we have, it's probably not interesting. Now, in order to cope with the problems that I mentioned in the previous slide, we need to normalize the expression values, and then we need to identify highly variable genes. So, remember, the idea is to cluster cells based on their expression patterns. So typically, we focus on about 2,000 highly variable genes, but many of those genes can actually behave in a similar fashion, so there is redundancy. So in order to reduce dimensions, we do a principal component analysis on those variable genes, and this way we reduce the dimensions from that 2,000 to, say, 10, for example. And then we use those principal components for clustering. But before the PCA, we need to scale the data so that high expressing genes won't dominate. And we can also regress out unwanted variation, which can be either technical or biological. So once we have our PCA results, we need to figure out which principal components are the significant ones. And then we use them for clustering the cells with graph-based clustering. We also use those PCs to visualize the clusters with non-linear dimensional reduction methods such as UMAP or DSNE. Finally, we can detect the market genes for the clusters and visualize them. So we will talk a lot about SERA, which is one of the most popular R packages for single cell. RNA-seq data analysis, it provides tools for all the steps that I mentioned, and it has tools also for many other kinds of analysis. Uh, one kind of analysis is integrative analysis, where we compare samples, and this is also covered during the course. SERA stores data in an R object, which is called SERA object. So it's a, a special data structure that has 
uh, specific slots for different types of data like UMI counts, PCA results, clustering results, etc. Now you might be wondering why an R package is called Seurat. Well, the name refers to the French painter Georges Seurat, who developed the pointillism style of painting. And obviously these dots are a bit similar to the dots we see in our cluster plots. I should also mention that there are many other R packages for single cell RNA-seq data analysis. One of them is SCADER, which has very rich functionality for quality control. So this course, single cell RNA-seq data analysis with Chipster, we focus on understanding the analysis methods. So what analysis steps are needed? How do those tools work? How do the different parameters affect the analysis? Understanding this theory is very important so that you are able to select the right tools and right parameter values. In the hands-on exercises, we use the RA, but we use it via the web-based Chipster software. So therefore, this course is suitable for anybody because you don't need any R programming skills. You also don't need to install any software because all the tools are running on the server side in the cloud. So the topics we cover during this course is we start from the UMI count matrix and then we find clusters and market chains for them. We also look at the case where we compare two samples, a treatment and control, and identify cell types that are present in both samples, obtain uh, market genes that are conserved in both samples and then find cell type specific responses to the treatment.